Under the eyes of the world's press and television, Greek archaeologist Liana Suvaltsis digs away at the remote Egyptian oasis of Siwa. She is searching for the holy grail of Greek popular archaeology, the final resting place of the most spectacular conqueror the world has ever known, Alexander the Great. Ever since my childhood, the myths and stories of Alexander the Great have captured my imagination. Today I'm an archaeologist at Newcastle University, and still Alexander fascinates me. Now why? Well, of course, we know that he was a great warrior and that he lived 300 years before Christ. But he was so much more than that. He genuinely believed that he was divine, and indeed his subjects worshipped him as a living god. Today, as after his mysterious death, his body is embroiled in intrigue. Where? Here. <laughs> Alexander is buried here. I shall be investigating Liana Suvaltsis' sensational discoveries at the oasis of Siwa, making Alexander today, as in his lifetime, a focus of worldwide attention. We found two Greek inscriptions, and the formations reveal the truth. But attention is on more than his physical whereabouts. Leading academics are probing ever deeper into the mind and soul of Alexander to try and understand the nature of his divinity. Those who inherited his empire believe they also were divine. And some of these self-styled god kings went to amazing lengths and indeed heights to celebrate their supernatural power. I'm in a mountaintop kingdom in Turkey of just such a god king, Antiochus. He's buried here under this huge mound to be near his fellow gods. And here they all are, seated on vast thrones, their toppled heads scattered down the mountainside. Now you might think that the story of Alexander's legacy could hardly go further. But during this program, I'm going to be exploring the idea that, amazingly, Alexander even affects the way we think today. That uh, Alexander is buried in Siwa, I am very positive. And what is one to make of archaeologist superstar Liana Subaltzis? Since 1989, she has been digging in the El Meraki area of Siwa, and for the last four years, she has been convinced that she has found the tomb of Alexander the Great. The first clue that he could be buried here came from listening to the local Siwans. The people are very superstitious, and they like to examine the omens everywhere. Uh, they look in the sky, and uh, from the flying of the birds, they can uh, see if something good is going to happen or bad. They told me that in this area, uh, according to their legends, was buried a famous king with his sword and his arms. That we are going to find the body, I'm very positive. We shall wait and we shall see. If the burial place of Alexander could be found, it would have enormous significance for the Greek and Egyptian peoples. But what are the prizes to be won? Well, judging from the finds in his father's tomb, there's the possibility of treasures on the scale of Tutankhamun. The sheer beauty of these ancient treasures serves to remind us of just how sophisticated Alexander's times were before their civilization faded away. It's probable that Alexander's treasure and tomb, if found, could resemble a newly discovered one underneath an earth tumulus near his birthplace in northern Greece. And I'm very excited that the site director has let me be the first visitor to take a look inside. 
a tomb was a home for the soul of the dead. And underneath this great pile of mud is um, a beautiful, well-preserved tomb facade. We're now inside the tomb, and as you can see, it's in fact empty. The floor is bare. And this, of course, could also be what happens if Alexander's tomb is discovered. The treasures have gone. And look, as we go up, we can see marks which look like heavy objects being pulled up, which have been scraped against the wall. Yes, here you can see it. There's this hole in the roof which the robbers went through. But the most likely resting place of Alexander is Egypt. And as we've heard, the present focus of world attention is the oasis of Siwa, honeycombed like this hill of the dead with burial chambers. This is just one of a whole labyrinth of Ptolemaic tombs in the Siwa area. Now, for those hunting for Alexander's long-lost tomb, the prize would be much more than the mere dream of finding treasure. It would be knowledge. We know that Alexander's body was embalmed and buried somewhere in Egypt, and mummified corpses from his time survive. There are parts of one behind me. And modern experts can extract lots of information from corpses like this. The Manchester Museum Mummy Forensic Team has been appointed by Liana Sulvaltsis to carry out the investigation on Alexander's body. Should we be presented with the body of Alexander, uh, it would be given the whole treatment um, which we give to other mummies, uh, that is it would be x-rayed, uh, we would then carry out some virtually non-destructive investigation using the endoscopes, we would take tissue samples which could be used for identifying disease, uh, for identifying the, the DNA of the mummy and possibly for uh, identifying the blood group. In the case of Alexander, I believe that there is some question that he drank rather heavily, and I'd be particularly interested in the liver. But, uh, Always controversial, Liana Sulvaltsis has her own theory about how Alexander died. There are some ancient uh, authors uh, saying that he died from poison. The poison was sent uh, from Macedonia. It's well known that, of course, that arsenic has, has been used uh, since antiquity, uh, and uh, certainly examination of the hair often reveals in bodies that have been around for a long time that they've died from arsenic poisoning. Statues and other likenesses of Alexander abound. It's said that although he was short, he had the most beautiful of forms, with fair skin and a sweet smell. He had a liquid gaze and flushed readily. But would the finding of his bodily remains ever make it possible to get an idea of what he actually looked like? If we had the skull of Alexander the Great, then we would be able to do with him what we did with his father, Philip II of Macedon, namely this. What we did with that cremated skull from Vergina was to reconstruct the face on the skull. And that is actually the result of a great deal of medical research. So if this was the skull of Alexander the Great, we would make a plaster cast of it. Into that cast, we would insert pegs at 21 points. That is all shown here. The lips beginning to be built up, and then over that one adds the subcutaneous tissue in the skin to get the finished face. And we would then have a face that all his soldiers would have recognised. That would be exciting. I'm in Thessalonica, in the Macedonian area of northern Greece, Alexander Territory. National Day serves to illustrate their newfound expression of Greek pride. It was less than two centuries ago that the Greeks threw off 500 years of Turkish domination. They are fervently proud of Alexander the Great. Like King Arthur for the British, the spirit of Alexander is sleeping, not dead, and his ideas can make Greece great again. 
και το, το μεγαλούργησε όλο έξω. He is saying that the significance of Alexander is that he goes beyond frontiers, goes beyond the frontiers of Greece and is a world figure. Sharing in their excitement helps me to understand why the progress of the Arna Suvalt Seas is so keenly followed. Possession of the body of Alexander has always been of paramount importance, particularly during the power struggle on his death. Today, it would still be an important relic, and national feelings would certainly run high if the body were to be discovered. So, where is the body? My search has brought me to Alexandria, on Egypt's Nile Delta, the greatest of the many cities Alexander founded and gave his name to. From what trustworthy ancient accounts there are, we know that Alexander's body was on display here from shortly after his death in 323 BC for almost 600 years. And for scientists hoping to get their hands on him, this is quite a likely place, I think, for his body to be unearthed. The trouble is, Alexandria has never ceased to be a living, vibrant community. So the modern city has grown up on layer upon layer of the past. And precisely because the Greek and Roman city is now so deep down, it's never really been properly excavated. But chance discoveries from time to time have revealed tantalizing glimpses of an ancient world under these pavements. This labyrinth of burial chambers, now being drained by Egyptian archaeologists, was stumbled upon a hundred years ago when a donkey and cart literally fell into it. It's these chance discoveries that feed the dreams of Greek enthusiasts bent on recovering the body of their beloved Alexander. This is just one of a warren of Roman catacombs in use at the time we lose track of Alexander's body. This is the mortuary chamber, guarded by fearsome Egyptian demons, now dressed as Roman legionaries. And here, the burial rites are supervised by the traditional pharaonic gods. But what further light can be shed on the mystery of his whereabouts? Well, there are a few historical records to go on which tell us more. It seems that Alexander's body had come to rest here in Alexandria in a Lenin-like display, surrounded by the corpses of his royal Macedonian successors in Egypt, the Ptolemies. Now, all we know about his supposedly magnificent mausoleum is that on the surface there was a pyramid seemingly recalling the grandiose ideas of the old pharaohs. Underneath the pyramid lay his mummified corpse, and people have hunted for this here in the Ptolemaic tombs of Alexandria. We know that, like this magnificent gold coffin of Tutankhamun's, Alexander's original sarcophagus was also solid gold. But one of the last Ptolemies, pressed for cash, replaced this gold version with a see-through one, probably alabaster. Now, what happened after the last recorded sighting of the body in AD 215 is guesswork. The widely held view is that both tomb and body went up in smoke during a revolt here in the AD 270s, or that it was in a part of the city now under the sea. But I suppose it's just about conceivable that his mausoleum remained intact until the triumph of Christianity in the 4th century AD. I wonder if it's utterly fanciful to think that maybe then his pagan devotees secreted the body away into a chamber like this in Alexandria to escape the anti-pagan zeal of the local Christians. Or could they even have taken it out to El Meraki in Siwa? Although Siwa is a long way from Alexandria, it's in this oasis, 800 years after Alexander's death, that we find a Christian Roman emperor stamping out the last traces of an Alexander-worshipping cult. And it's here today that the international press are watching for the latest developments. In searing heat, Liana Sulvaltsis doggedly holds on to her claim that this is Alexander's last resting place. We know that Alexander had expressed the will be buried in Siwa. And it was not the will of a simple person. He was the will of a king and of a god. 
There are a lot of findings in Siwa. The star, eight ray, ray star. The discovery of the two fragments forming this star are for Liana a key piece of evidence, resembling, she claims, the eight pointed royal star of Macedon. Yes, it could have eight points, but it seems to me there is no axis of symmetry needed for it to be a star. And then there are the newly discovered inscriptions, which she claims prove that this is Alexander's tomb, and furthermore state that Alexander was poisoned. Experts dispute this. They say it is not written the word poison. It is written here, you. You. But this is the Latin personal name, Servius, Servius Sulpicius. This no. is part of no, a... No, 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 no. This is you. This is not a, a name. You. It's so, the poison. So can you just tell us, because this is fascinating, what you think these words mean? Epi, seu, iu, sulpicius. What does this mean? Ah, uh, sulpicius, of course, it is a Roman name. But uh, I told you, be patient and you will uh, know everything, I hope, very soon. Well, what did I make of her, this current archaeological superstar? She's certainly a delightful woman and I must say I admire her enthusiasm and fizz. The trouble is, it's precisely these qualities which make her the opposite of a dispassionate investigator. The bunker mentality here at El Meraki has resulted in the withholding of vital evidence needed if top experts are to contribute to the debate. Talking to her rapidly degenerates into a cat and mouse game. But I will say that what I heard in no way encourages me to expect an imminent discovery of the body. To give a precise example, she claims one of her inscriptions hints at the death of Alexander by poison but specialists in Greek inscriptions would easily recognize in her word for poison part of the word Servius, a common Roman name. Liana Suvaltsis is but the latest in the line who imagine feeling the power of being near the body of Alexander. But as always in this search, you never know what will happen next. The head of the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities certainly doesn't dismiss this location. There should be something belonging to Alexander in Alexandria, but there is no also um, there is no doubt that there should have been something for him also in Siwa. We didn't find the mummies in the tomb of the kings in Egypt, you know, in the Valley of the Kings. We found the mummies uh, were stored somewhere else. So it's not, it's not necessary to find the mummy, but at least to be sure about the text. Well, what has she found? An earlier study by the famous Egyptian archaeologist Ahmed Fakhri records a small Doric temple at El Meraki, and this is what Liana Suvaltsi seems to have rediscovered. But experts analysing the architectural details suggest a date for this at least a century after Alexander's death. In fact, Liana Suvaltsi, through her finds, may unwittingly provide the key to the true identity of who was worshipped here. This fragment has the Greek word for goddess, Theos, followed by two letters probably from the beginning of the name Isis. So it could be in fact that what we've got is a previously unknown temple to the Egyptian super goddess Isis, nothing to do with Alexander. Riveting though the hunt for Alexander's tomb is, academics are now starting to realise that there is something far more important for us today than his mere corpse. It's the search for the truth about his life, and here feelings can run high. I sort of regard Alexander as a, a figure strongly analogous to Hitler. He comes riding in on his great white horse, a symbol of control of all the unruly forces of darkness. I should think he would probably be a rather, uh, rather aggressive and mindless young man. <laughs> In spite of such conflicting views, we do know for certain that by the end of his spectacularly successful life, both he and his subjects believed he was divine. And experts tell us that the fallout from this new phenomenon affects many of the world religions to this day. Could this possibly be true? Well, first, we have to search out those aspects of his life which led Alexander to believe he was a living god. Even before Alexander was born, his family was bathed in a supernatural aura because they claimed descent from the mythical Heracles, a frighteningly strong Greek who earned his place among the gods after a lifetime of heroic achievements. 
His family ancestors lived on the foothills of the northern Greek mountains. The more sophisticated southern Greeks of the time regarded these northerners as primitive and superstitious, and it's said that in these mountains Alexander's mother Olympias led supernatural rites and took part in orgiastic ceremonies. These leanings of his wife alienated King Philip, her husband. Her pursuits clashed with his no-nonsense military lifestyle, and these occult activities also gave rise to rumours, surely overheard by the child Alexander, that his actual father was none other than the half-Greek, half-Egyptian god, Zeus Amor. Alexander's upbringing in a palace rife with magic and ancestor worship could well have encouraged a mystical streak and left him open in later life to the idea that his achievements were revealing his own divinity. Alexander quickly proved to be a brilliant military leader. He led from the front, spearheading the cavalry charges. He was supremely brave and inspired his men. At the defining battle of Issus, he defeated a Persian army many times his size, at one stage leading a charge right to King Darius himself, forcing him to flee the battlefield. He never, however, damaged a religious shrine. His conquest gathered pace, taking more and more of the vast and powerful Persian Empire. Within the first three years of his campaign, he had united all Greece, thrown the Persians out of Asia Minor, and taken Judea. He then headed towards North Africa, where he was to have his first encounter with a major civilization centuries older than his own. Alexander arrived in Egypt in 332 BC, liberating it from the hated Persians. Although Egypt had just felt the raw power of Alexander, he in turn was now to have a close encounter with the raw power of the Egyptian gods. Two lines of rams marked the entrance to the massive temple of Amun at Thebes. This god was to play a big part in Alexander's life. For the Egyptians, our moon was the father of creation. The pharaohs ruled by his will and thanked him by adding yet more to this extraordinary complex. Right in the heart of the temple, we see Alexander himself assuming the role of a semi-divine pharaoh, making pious offerings to our moon, the god he'd learnt about as a child. The hieroglyphs say, Alexander is king of the south and north, chosen of our moon and beloved of the sun god Ra, son of the sun, lord of risings. One particular branch of this cult was much frequented by Greeks, the oracle of our moon in the western desert at Siwa. Alexander decided to march there, interrupting his relentless campaign against the Persians. It seems he had an irresistible yearning to find out from this famous oracle if he was indeed the son of our moon. The journey to Siwa was no picnic, and for someone in the middle of a long and dangerous military campaign, this major digression into the desert was strategically risky and indeed foolhardy. Even for me, travelling today in the relative luxury of a vehicle, the journey brings home just how remote this Saharan oasis is. We've been travelling for hour upon hour across baking, empty desert. And I can't help thinking that if we break down, we really will be in the proverbial. Now, the Greek historian Diodorus writes, After four days, the army's water gave out, and Alexander's men fell into a fearful thirst. All were in great despair and feared for their lives. Well, luckily, and as if to prove the gods were on his side, a rainstorm saved them, and they finally beheld the blue waters of Siwa.
Even today, Siwa remains a strange and isolated community. The village reminds me of a sort of anthill, with parts living and parts fossilized. High on a rocky outcrop sits the once world-famous Oracle Temple of our moon. Travelers would approach with trepidation, knowing their future was about to be revealed. The Greeks equated the divine presence here, the god our moon, with Zeus, the most powerful of their gods. When the pilgrim finally got to the top of the mound, he approached the temple itself. The Roman historian Curtius says that when Alexander arrived here, he was welcomed by priests and by local women chanting hymns to our moon. It's difficult to envisage just what the god our moon looked like, but he seems to have manifested himself in different forms. Above all, invisibly and powerfully, as the wind which whips up the great sandstorms around the oasis. And as a ram that would appear to lost travellers and guide them here. Now, what happened next is a mystery, because the prophet priest took Alexander into the Holy of Holies here on his own. And even on his deathbed, Alexander never revealed the secret words of the god. But a clue as to their content emerges from Plutarch's account of what happened the very next time Alexander was exposed to great danger with his troops. He uttered up a prayer, implying he now believed he was the son of a god. Listen, you gods, Alexander shouted. If I really am your son, help us now as we go into battle. From Egypt, Alexander and his unstoppable army marched ever eastwards as far as what is now Afghanistan. In Pakistan, he fought against fearsome war elephants. This coin shows Alexander attacking an elephant, and this later one from Egypt shows him wearing an elephant's scalp, implying that he has now even taken on the power of an elephant. In just 13 years, he had completely conquered the Persians and now had control of the largest empire the world had ever known. Untold wealth began to flow back to Macedonia. Even their coins were now of gold. With the Macedonians now the master race, there was mounting belief that their leader was more than a man, that they were being led, in fact, by a man-god, and they sought ever more extravagant ways to reflect this. As Alexander neared the end of his life, he saw himself ever more strongly as a god. Indeed, the ancient writers suggest that he issued an order demanding divine worship from his subjects. Visitors now had to prostrate themselves in obeisance before him. But all this was to come to an abrupt and untimely end. Alexander died at the age of 32 in Babylon as he was planning yet more conquests. As he lay dead, shock and dismay spread through his entourage. Did he die of alcohol, of fever, or did jealous Macedonian rivals poison him? Whoever possessed his body would be seen as his heir, and Macedonian generals prepared to take it back to Greece, in spite of Alexander's deathbed command to be buried at Siwa. A vast wheeled temple taking two years to build housed and transported his divine remains. Hauled by 64 mules and preceded by an army of road builders, it travelled through his empire. The occupants of the towns and villages it went through paid homage as if a very god was passing them by. As the procession went through Syria, Alexander's close friend Ptolemy, who was governor of Egypt, hijacked it and diverted it towards the Nile. But in the end, even Ptolemy ignored his king's dying wish and took the body back to his new Egyptian capital, Alexandria. Out of the death of the historical Alexander was born something new and lasting, 
For the Greeks, the godlike saviors and supermen of their mythical past had finally crystallized into human form. Gradually, they developed the notion both in his lifetime and very much more afterwards that Alexander had been sent from heaven, that he had, as it were, been loaned to the world for a limited period and that upon his death the gift had been revoked. The people that were in his immediate entourage, his colleagues, his generals, they certainly see him as somebody who is marked out by the divine. Stories about how when he was marching along the coast in southern Turkey, the sea bowed down to do him homage is told by one of the people that was in his entourage. To the Greeks, divinity was not a matter of supreme goodness or holiness. It was all about awesome, invisible power, which, if you could tap into it with the right rituals, sacrifices and so on, could confer great benefactions. His um, successors who take over his fragmented kingdom, they use Alexander, they use his image, and they use the idea of kings being gods. Surely the ultimate example of Alexander's heirs seeing themselves as divine is to be found here in the remote mountains of eastern Turkey. A dirt track winds up to a vast mausoleum complex on the top of Mount Nemrut. The creator of this place was King Antiochus I of Commagene, whose head has toppled down from his throne over there. He ruled the region about 2,000 years ago. The scene here says it all. The headless statue of Antiochus sits seemingly on the roof of the world, indeed on the very threshold of heaven. By presuming to seat himself among the gods, with the goddess of plenty on one side and Apollo on the other, Antiochus is in effect telling us that he is one of them. And here he shakes hands with the god Apollo, as if they were equals. Now come and look at the inscription on the back of the statues, where Antiochus, in his own words, sets out his religious beliefs. Here, boring old grammar proves to be the most potent tool for bringing his deepest thoughts to life. Now, over here, in the nominative case, is his name and his titles, meaning that he is the subject. And over here is a verb in the first person, Epoi es amen, I made, meaning he's saying, I did such and such. And this is a verb in the present tense, horas, you see, meaning that he was alive when the text was composed. And over here is the ancient Greek passage, Antiochos Theos, meaning he's saying, I am a living God. Well, you could be forgiven for thinking that Alexander's impact had peaked here in these mountains. But his conquests did not stop here, of course. They extended several thousand more miles eastwards to India, where his arrival triggered changes as dramatic as these, but in the mind. And this also applied down here to the south in the homeland of Judaism, where Alexander's influence brought about a transformation in Jewish attitudes in the years leading up to the birth of Christ. This assimilation of Greek ideas as a result of Alexander, Hellenization as it's called, resulted in the whole of the known world becoming one melting pot of religious ideas. Current research is now revealing for the first time that remarkably Alexander affected the religions of India, Islam and early Christianity and key aspects of Judaism. A new sort of Jewish leader emerged, a teacher or rabbi, based on the idea of Greek philosophical schools. Here by the burning bush is the great Jewish hero Moses, now in a Greek-style robe. On this synagogue floor is the pagan Greek sun god, Helios. Behind his head is a disc and rays representing the sun. And again, with flares of light to emphasize his divine radiance, is a successor to Alexander in Syria, Antiochus VI, taking on the concept of a god-king. These successor kings went further. A later Syrian king, Demetrius III, is calling himself Theos and Sota, god and saviour. 
When the Romans became the imperial power following the Greeks, they too decided that, like Alexander, they were god kings. Here, Augustus is calling himself Divi Filius, son of a god. And in the early Christian era, the emperor Nero goes one further and sports a radiate crown to suggest his divinity. And here, in this early mosaic from beneath the Vatican, and adorned with the self-same solar flares used by the Roman emperors, is the leader of the newly emerging religion of Christianity, Jesus. Conventional Christians uh, usually think that Jesus was naturally divine and that uh, the early Christians uh, did not need to uh, interpret uh, his divinity or, but simply record uh, what they had experienced of him. Although mainstream theology continues to emphasize the Old Testament precedents for the launch of Christianity and maintains that something pretty unusual happened around the death of Jesus, the controversial Professor Burton Mack does not think that the Jesus of the early church came from the Jewish tradition. The kings of Israel, uh, as they were seen, portrayed, and uh, eulogized in later his historical reports, were never understood to be divine. So the notion of divinity, and especially of a universal royal divine figure, uh, it just does not come from uh, the Israelite tradition. His radical solution is to look elsewhere for the inspiration for the Christ we have today. This fascination with Alexander is that you have, uh, for the first time, a clear concept of a man-god. And uh, so at the same time as we have this marvelous romance of Alexander, uh, filling the mentality of the time. We have the Gospels being written about Jesus, and the similarities are striking. In a nutshell, Professor Mack is making the revolutionary claim that the fundamental nature of Christ as both man and God ultimately derived from the Greek tradition of the divinity of Alexander. Of course, the message of Jesus, as opposed to his packaging, was new and based on non-violence and a God of love. Thousands of miles to the east, another teacher of similar ideas was about to get the Alexander treatment. The features of Buddhism before Alexander, essentially, the, the Buddha was a philosophical figure rather similar to Plato or Socrates. He had not emerged as a great superman, a godlike figure. And uh, in the first two centuries AD, roughly speaking, Buddhism undergoes a major transformation where uh, the Buddha is elevated from being a simple human being into a superman, or you could say a god in some sense. So uh, these statues come from the part of India which Alexander conquered and which subsequently uh, retained its connections with the Western world. So figures there typically show the Buddha with a halo and with robes of Greek and Roman type. The same things happen in Hinduism at roughly the same time. Images begin to be produced which show Hindu deities holding the weapons and, for example, a club all these things that are connected with Heracles. We don't know the direct impact of Alexander as an individual on these things. We know that Alexander uh, assumed divine characteristics uh, as a result of his conquest of Egypt and various parts of uh, Asia. Uh, and it seems to have been a, a, a groundswell of change in religious attitudes, this need for some sort of superhuman being, some sort of super person who could be a savior for mankind. Eventually, the civilizations of Egypt, Greece, and Rome died away and much of classical thought was lost as Europe entered the Dark Ages. But not all was lost. The tales of Alexander blocked medieval Europe 
loved his story, now romanticized out of all recognition. Alexander, now in the guise of a medieval knight, was being used as a model of virtue, bravery, and above all of a traveler to the ends of the earth to fight distant barbarians. It may seem odd that a figure so purely military as Alexander could be accepted and seen as a paragon of virtue by, by the medieval Christians, but let's not forget that medieval Christianity was also a highly military religion. A thousand years after the death of Alexander, Muhammad, a prophet from the Arabian Peninsula, founded the religion of Islam. Unlike Hinduism and Buddhism, the first generations of Muslims felt driven to expand the Islamic world by the sword, and from its beginnings at Mecca, Islam quickly won a vast holy empire, as big in fact as its Roman predecessor. The impressive Arab citadel in Cairo, containing the magnificent Muhammad Ali Mosque, emphasizes the sophistication and military might of Islam. New research by historians is bringing to light an important source of inspiration for their military conquests. Early Arab writings suggest that the precedent they were following in this armed expansion of God's kingdom on earth was none other than Alexander the Great, whom they saw as a military genius, but conquering for God's glory not his own. The first appearance of Alexander in Arabic literature is in fact in the Quran. Alexander is, of course, not normally known by the name of Alexander in, in the Quran and in the other early Arabic writings. The name he's given is Dulkarnain, which means the two-horned one in Arabic. That's a name that he acquires from the representations of him where he is shown with the ram's horns of his supposed father, the god Ammon. This is a unique image. It represents Alexander the Great visiting the Kaaba at Mecca, the holy black stone which is, stands at the centre of the most holy city of the Islamic world. No image could express more clearly how seriously Alexander was taken by Muslim thinkers and writers in the medieval world. So, amazingly, it seems that many of the world's faiths as we know them today owe much to Alexander's legacy. I end as I began so many months ago, looking for the final resting place of Alexander's body. Back here in Egypt, Alexandria remains a city of mystery. In ancient times, this shaft was used for lowering the dead into the catacombs of Komal Shugafa, down below me. I think that in this half-submerged labyrinth of burial chambers underneath modern Alexandria, I've got about as close as I'm going to get to the body of Alexander. But you never quite know what will turn up. Construction of their new library has just been halted because of fresh finds, and they're planning a dig on the site of the ancient Dulkarnain Mosque. And Liana Suvaltsis digs on, sure she's on the point of discovering her beloved Alexander. She keeps finding little things. Are these Macedonian stars on girls' dresses? And on rings? And what are the secrets in these strange circle dances said to be descended from the worship of our moon in Alexander's day? And she claims that their baby's headdresses are modelled on the helmets of Alexander's army. When I'm gone, I like my ashes be scattered in the desert near Alexander. Well, what have I come to know about Alexander at the end of my search? Writers of all ages seem to have placed a smokescreen around Alexander. He has become all things to all men, both admired as the noblest of humans and reviled as the cruelest of despots. The extraordinary military success of this wandering conqueror and the godlike power he wielded as a result seem to have fed a universal need in us for a hero who somehow transcends our ordinary human limitations. And because he died young, these achievements were never tarnished by old age, bitterness or physical decline. 
The myth of Alexander belongs to us all, to use as we will.